Hello there, we're back doing another of the Criterion Memories project, celebrating uh, 60 years of the Criterion Theatre, um, where I've been interviewing people past and present, um, notables, and look over here, it's Peter Bagley. Hello, Pete. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, well, I'm uh, surviving slowly in these days of pandemic and um, looking forward to the theatre being open once more. So if nothing else, having a drink at the bar. Yeah, it's very sad just thinking about it just sitting there being empty and all the voices and people and Well, at this, at this point of recording, we seem to be moving to a point where we may be, we may be in luck with a live production very shortly. So looking forward to that. Yes. So let's start at the beginning. When, when did you get involved with the Criterion? So the Criterion is 60. You're, you've, you've racked up quite a um, number of those. Well, 69 I joined, 1969. So that's what makes it 52, 52, 53, something like that, years. On and off, been away, came back, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yes, 1969, during a, a production or the rehearsals of Reluctant Heroes in 1969, and um, the drama group that I had been associated with since school, basically it was a load of school friends, we'd all got together, it had finally fallen apart. That was the Curtains Amateur Dramatic Society, or CADS, as we like to be known. <laughs> And um, when it folded, Phil, my elder brother, who many people hopefully remember, um, he said, well, come down to the Criterion and see what we do down there. So I think I'd been to see one production. And to be honest, I can't remember what it was. It may have been Richard III or Macbeth. I can't remember anyway. So I went down and uh, he said to Jeff Bennett, who was directing the show, do you mind if my kid brother sits and watches a rehearsal? He's thinking of joining. So Jeff said, yeah, of course, kids, you sit down there, you know. So I sat at the back and watched the first act uh, unfold. And um, then it came to the interval and everybody started to do their various things as they, they always do during uh, the breaks in, in, in re rehearsal. And uh, Reg Fletcher, who was stage manager, for the show came down and pointed at me and said what are you doing here and, and I looked at him and I was only 19 I didn't know you know uh, what the protocols were or anything uh, I just said oh, nothing he said right come and help me so I ended up in the usual pose of the human cleat holding <laughs> a, a, a flat up while he lashed it together those were the days when they used to do that sort of thing and then he said uh, at the end, he said, well, what are you doing next week? I said, uh, nothing. He said, right, you've got a job. So I was down there for every night of the production the following week. And I think it was the week after that that I actually joined the company. So uh, I wasn't a member to begin with when I first went on the stage, but we managed, we managed. It's fantastic. Uh, at, the end of, at the end of this process of all of these interviews, I'm definitely going to edit everybody's Jeff Bennett impression just into <laughs> one into one super cut because everyone does it and it, it well, absolutely inimitable but he had, he had a certain style to all to himself a good one you know I mean he was always great um and uh, we all have a, a loving memory of him yes I think mean, I say there's a there's we've expressed it in other interviews there's a, a huge amount of uh just respect I think absolutely um, Absolutely. Um, Even when he was wrong, he was still, you know, still in there batting. <laughs> so were you, were you fully on board then straight away? Um, yeah, actually, the, the, the following three shows I actually worked on. I, I didn't act in them. Uh, I was doing props um, with, uh, with Moira Fair, or Moira Gates as she was then, um, on the next show, which was Celebration. Then I was doing set building, I think. Anyway, there were about three shows ran straight afterwards, and I, I was working on them. And then I was in the fourth, I think, which was um, 
I, I want to say, say the rainfall came, but it was not. After the rain. After the rain, that's the one. That's the one. Um, and, and I was in that one, yes. Playing an old man, which seemed to be my forte throughout my career in the Criterion. At, but, at the uh, age of 20? At the age of 20. Well, yes, 1920. Um, but now I am old. I, I either don't get the parts... <laughs> And I certainly don't get the juvenile leads anymore. So I was going to uh, say you need to start aging, aging down. Uh, yes, yes, yes. The I could be the what was his name, Barry Button of uh, the Criterion Theatre. Yeah, Barry. I mean, I, I should. I'm not. I'm not that au okay fait with the plays. Um, if people are impressed, I am obviously using simultaneously the amazing Criterion archive to to verify all of these things. Um, yeah, I've got you down for. Uh, for five shows in 1970 and I think five in 71 as well. So you would well, I think, yeah, certainly... The thing, the thing was, I mean, I, I was still relatively young. I mean, I was 1920, obviously, at that point. And the place was humming. It was buzzing with activity. If you weren't involved in a show and there was so much to learn when you were involved in a show. Um, although I'd been, as I say, belonging to... Um, uh, uh, a previous amateur dramatic society it was in no way like the criterion you know we used to build sets so we could have a party on them never mind a play you know it was that sort of laissez-faire attitude i suppose and um so it became very very interesting and preoccupying to actually be involved in plays so soon every six weeks there was a new play, there was a new cast, there was a new group, and you got to know friends very, very well, very, very quickly. Um, and that's what one of the things I loved about the place, plus the fact that you could go in and have a drink at the same time, which was really good. So, yeah. um, so yes, the, 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 I did do a lot of, lot of shows to begin with, tailed off as, I guess, other things came along, like girlfriends, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know, three and three and seventy two and seventy three. I mean, you were still, you were still pretty. Yeah, yeah, but it was all enjoyable. Yeah, it was what I, it, I, I felt I wanted to do, um, and the more I could do of it, the better. So uh, whether it was acting or helping on on stage, um, or what, uh, I, I I'd be happy to uh, to, to, to to do it. And I love to get Jeff Bennett, another little Jeff Bennettism. I used to love to get his postcards. He would notify you that he would want to you to uh, be in a play uh, by postcard in his glorious ink pen and his flowing writing. And uh, it was a real thrill to get one of those through the post. We didn't have the internet then. <laughs> You've been conscripted. Yes, yes. It was good fun, though. Very, very good fun. And you met such marvellous friends, who were people who were still friends and still around the place and still themselves involved in the theatre. Uh, and I think that's one of the uh, points of wonder about the theatre is the way that people are still drawn to it, still will come back to it, and will always find, hopefully, a friendly face to be able to say, hello, how are you? A long time no see, or whatever it may be. Mm. Yes, the, I mean, you can always I say I've, I've been, many people will know I've been moved away for probably about 15 years now, but I come back to Coventry. If I walk into the theatre, there will be at least 10 faces that turn around and smile and a couple that turn around and scowl, obviously, but, uh, but mostly. Oh, the they're the ones you still owe money to. <laughs> yes. Um, and also the criterion, uh, also the, the, the Tinder of its day as well. Um, an awful lot of people seem to have found friends and more there. Um, Indeed, yes. And the number of people that have found their other half, got married, had children, brought the children into the theatre, you know, need I look not any further than your good selves, yeah. uh, Jamie and Chris. You know, I mean, uh, you, you came into the theatre when you were knee-high to a grasshopper um, because your parents were there. So, yes, um, and it's where I found my future wife, Louise, and um, thank goodness she enjoyed it as much as I did. 
because there were aspects of our relationship which initially I thought were going to be a little bit of a um, a bar to our progressing. Um, the first date that I took her out on, we went to see Jesus Christ Superstar, the film, which had just opened. And I loved the music and we went along to see the show, to see the film, and I, I loved the film. And then the following week, we went to the old Coventry Theatre where they were re reviving Hair. Again, something I'd, I'd loved in, in earlier years. I remember going to Birmingham to see it three times in, in three weeks with uh, Keith Railton and um, Tom... Oh, I can't remember his surname. Tom Varney, I think. Was it Varney? Anyway, that's a slight digression. So that was two dates that I'd taken Louise out on, uh, both to musicals. And it was going home from the second one that she actually revealed that she didn't like musicals at all. <laughs> so I felt that, well, there must be something going on for us to actually sort of see each other after that, you know. She could so easily have just said, no, thank you very much. If it's all going to be musicals, then I want no part of it. But thank God she didn't. So did you meet Louise at the theatre or did you bring her into it? No. Um, I came into the bar one night and all I saw was a pair of long bronzed legs sticking out from beneath a mini skirt of a white Mary Quant one. And I thought, hello, hello. And being a young man, I, um, I, I felt drawn uh, to the person. And that's how I met Louise. She, she actually came to the theatre um, through, I can't remember, certainly Jean, your mum, and... Jane Railton were instrumental in encouraging her uh, to come down because they all worked at President Kennedy School, I think, at that point. Right. Um, okay. And she'd been doing some uh, set building at school for school plays. And they said, well, why don't you come down and uh, enjoy the, um, the criterion? So she did. And thank goodness for that. I was going to say, and this, so she was building for... 40 years almost after that yes yes i was, I was um, looking at her archive and i was uh i was noting that for pretty much any place she was involved in you know she, she was i mean for people who don't know louise i know she's been mentioned on on previous interviews already um building set, set design and building and construction um she was peerless um at the criterion and did it for an awful long time and and it was she would do a show and she would design it, paint it, and build it. Yeah. I mean, she, um, I think it was because she had such an interest. It wasn't just she was a painter by training. Um, she did fine art at Dundee College, but she had a great interest across a whole range of crafts and uh, materials and all the rest of it. So she could easily turn her hand to producing ceramics to woodworking, uh, to producing props and being very creative in terms of uh, a set. I mean, I still remember Harkin back to Beauty and the Beast and she came home one day with about four or five rolls of silver foil, aluminium foil. I said, what, what, what do we need that lot for? She said, they're for the set. And the whole thing was festooned with bits of aluminium foil, which she then painted and scrubbed and made glittery. It was just absolutely fantastic. Also for that one, I mean, she made what must have been at least a dozen large uh, frames, art frames, um, you know, all decorated, uh, no, no, nothing plain about them at all. They all looked you know, sort of like uh, uh, as though a grand old master had fallen out of it. It was, uh, it was great. So, yes, I mean, she was a real inspiration. Um, I, we had our differences. <laughs> I do remember one. I can't quite remember what it was all about, but I know it was about hobby horses. <laughs> actual, actual hobby horses? It, well, not your for real hobby uh, horses, but I mean, the sort that you would use in a, a mummer's show or uh, children might use as a, you know, that sort of thing. And um, 
We had a big row about that. <laughs> I think she won again. She often did, I think. I I I remember one of my favorite Louise memories was I was I would say to her, like, I've got an idea. Because Louise was also head of set design for, for a long time. And I I would often try and do something a bit different with sets. And Louise would point out why that was a stupid idea. Um I think it was 12 Angry Men. I remember her coming in and I said, I'm, I'm going to put the table in the middle of the auditorium and have the audience on all sides. And she just looked and she went, no. <laughs> and it was because of the banking. It was, it was, I hadn't thought through the fact that people would be raked up and looking down so they wouldn't see anything, uh, which Louise obviously spotted that immediately. She was very good at looking at an empty space and seeing what to put in it that yeah. would work um, yeah. as opposed to not. Um, also shout out to the Treasure Island set, which was, uh, which was a boat inside. Um, it, it, it did cause us problems though, when it was first mooted, because of course that was the point where she brought in um, a, a, a surveyor yes. to see whether the structure would take having um, a mast swung down from the auditorium roof um and of course he then said well no you've got a real problems here and we had to close the place yes so the, a few months waiting the, th the theater roof was for quite a while um and it, a thorny issue uh it's i mean it's a very old building um it is so i know that the and, and, you know it probably hadn't been maintained prior to the criteria taking it over and maybe the maintenance regime when the, it was the criterion wasn't that hot since they felt that they'd done an awful lot to begin with you know yeah and they had they con converted it superbly well but um i'm afraid yes an old building does need a lot of care and attention over the years as we've discovered and it doesn't take well to having a load of rigging and pirates climbing over it no 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 Dead but, or alive. I was going to say, but the, apart from inside the play, 100% uh, success rate, no no deaths in that particular show. Uh, no, <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, so over the years, you've done an incredible kind of breadth of things. So you, you've done lots of backstage stuff, onstage stuff, set construction. I imagine there's a lot more set construction that you did that is not credited just because you were helping, helping Louise. Um, and then, you know, lots of, lots of acting and, and direction as well. So you, you've really spanned all of the, the disciplines. Is there something that you feel like is your favourite thing? <sighs> I mean, let's just say favourite things. What, 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 what are the favourite things that you've done, you've been involved with, me memorable productions? Well, I think... I think one of the... the, the, the one of the things that I enjoyed most was uh, La Cries, which was back in 1990. And just in, in 1989, I blame this on the Holmeses, um, Dave and Linda Holmes, they decided that they wanted to go down to Sidmouth Folk Festival and asked us if we'd like to go camping with them. Uh, we said, yeah, okay, we, you know, hadn't been to anything folky since Pete Seeger sang about his little boxes, you know, I mean, it was that long ago. And um, we were okay about camping and all the rest of it. So we went and had a wonderful time, had an absolutely marvellous time, and got interested in folk music again. And from folk music, went led to um, Morris dancing and... Eventually, I ended up joining a, a side, as some people may know. But the point of that introduction was that I got interested in Larkrise, which sort of harkened back to the late 1800s um, in, the, in, in Oxford and the growing up of a, of a young girl in this rural community. And the particular production, the, the script that I had, which was originally written um, for the National Theatre, uh, required a sort of a, a folky type band. Enter Hugh Rippon, some people may know Hugh, um, who was a big folk aficionado, and he introduced me 
to a band called Peeping Tom, um, who again probably resonate with a lot of people that uh, have been at the theatre for some time. And we decided that, I decided that I would really quite like to do this Lark Rise with the band uh, and all the rest of it. The one problem was, of course, at that time, in, up to that point, uh, the seating for the audience was fixed. It was not movable. So could I conceive of Lark Rise being on stage? Not really, not the way that I wanted to do it with a band and all the rest of it. So I said to Anne Woodward, who was um, uh, chairman or chairperson at that point, uh, I said, how do you fancy taking the seats out in the auditorium, the fixed ones? And she listened to my ideas and said, yeah, that sounds all right. So we spent a couple of weeks gradually lifting out these seats that had been there, as far as I know, I can't remember them being changed, they may have been, um, but certainly had been there from the start. And as the seats came out, it was marvellous to see people come in and think, oh, wait a minute, we've got a space here. We didn't have that. This could pre be pretty good. And anyway, we went ahead with, with Lark Rise and Annie said, these fixed seats go back in over my dead body. Oh, bless her. She was good to a word. She, we, we started a fund and we got, as a temporary measure, we got a load of plastic chairs in um, that people could sit on in a normal cross arch style uh, of production. But then when we needed to, when we wanted to, when we wanted to sort of branch out a little bit, we had the extra space. And ultimately, of course, we had rate seating which meant that we could rake it around the sides, we could do it normally, we could even do it backwards so that we were playing against the bar wall. Um, uh, but it was that moment, I think, when people looked at the space and started to realise the potential mm. of it. And that, for me, was one of the greatest moments, you know. And I, I like to think that Lark Rise and Candleford and actually all those shows that we did around that time um, were all greatly received by the audience. You know, they all seem to enjoy it. So, so that's yeah. good. Well, that's, that's filled a very important gap in my knowledge. Cause I, we were, I was talking to somebody the other week about when, when those seats were changed. Um, and yes, that would have been it. And that's why. 1990. Yeah. The, the, one, of the, one of the reasons why we did it then, I think, was because my birthday's on March the 31st and we wanted the extra space. We used the extra space that we'd created to have a party in there for my <laughs> birthday. And it was a great party because I'd invited an old, old friend from long ago um, called Errol Jenkins. And uh, anybody that knew Errol, he was a character to say the least. And he'd learned circus skills. Now, he was a man that we didn't think would actually live beyond 21 because he was as thin as a, a rake, smoked, had a hacking cough and <laughs> you know, all this sort of business. And uh, part of his routine was to um, juggle with knives. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and he persuaded in my birthday party in the auditorium to get Dave Holmes to lie on the floor. <laughs> And he was walking up and down, Dave, juggling these knives. Thank God, I think Dave escaped unharmed. But uh, Yes, and yeah. the, the theatre insurance policy, I presume. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we wouldn't get away with it these days. No, there was no health and safety back then. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't exist. It was invented in 1994. It just shows um, you what you can do when you move the seats. Yeah. Yeah, um... Yeah, we're, we're still, if anyone knows the, the background of the seats uh, that's watching and wants to let me know, um, because I think I remember those, those purple cinema seats. As far as I was there, they, they were always there. Um, and I think some, one of the founder members I spoke to has suggested that they had changed them once, I think, in the 70s, maybe. Um, so if anyone knows... Do let me know. This is a this is a back and forth project. We want we want to we want to try and get all of the details correct. Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, you think of things like Midsummer Night's Dream, which which you which you directed and designed, um, which was also I enjoyed really that one very much as well. If only, if only, I mean, for people who have not seen it and they've not looked at the archive photos, it was quite a big set built on a rake. And again, because we had no fixed seating, we were able to have seating all around. Uh, and um, we had a very steep rake uh, of a rostra um, in the middle of the set. And everybody was saying, well, gosh, this is awfully steep, awfully steep. But Louise, in her usual canny way, scattered sand into the paint. So you, there was a grip. Yeah. She actually came at the end of the production. She said, you know, she said, this is the healthiest I've been in ages. Just walking up and down, you know, this sanded after. But the, the ultimate moment for me was the sight of Matt Sweatman as Puck appearing out of the trap door, lit from underneath, half naked, covered in tattoos, shaved head and tattoos on his head, a pair of safety glasses and two torches either side, yeah. looking like, um, what was his name? Swampy from the, uh, the, yeah. the woods. Um, it's, it's his name. I think he's, he's back in business at the moment. I think he's, he's in the tunnels under Houston, I think. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I thought I'd read something about that. Didn't realise it was the same one. Yes, we, we spoke to Jenny Holmes um, in another interview and she, she, she talked a lot about Matt's role in that and that when he would get home and kind of be covered in henna, wasn't it? It was, it was a sort yes, of, yes. We didn't actually get him tattooed for the... Just no, 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 no. That would be a step too far, I think. But yeah, there's there's some photos on the archive if people want to go and have a look at. But I I think his body ones, I don't think he I don't think he bathed for the whole week, because the body ones he just covered up and went to work, which was actually a record for Matt to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ah, dear, but uh, yes, some of the things we ask of people uh, in productions are quite incredible, but um, they do them willingly. Yes, yeah, but that that was a. a well, I felt again it was a, it was a, a nice production, uh, and and talking of Louise, I mean, um, and her dedication to the sets and all the rest of it. I mean, the one that always sticks in my mind and comes up quite regularly in conversation, particularly between me and Keith, um, is Old Herbaceous, yeah. which was a phenomenal set, really. Um, Colk Abbey, the National Trust, had given Louise and I carte blanche to go around Colk Abbey, um, particularly the sort of the gardeners' offices and uh, buffies and goodness knows what, where people wouldn't normally go and, and take photographs and measurements and goodness knows what. And she incorporated on that set um, a most of the details from it. And of course, at that point, we were still having roofing problems above the stage, so we couldn't use that. So we had to effectively turn all the seating, uh, a quarter turn, facing the wall that you come in to the auditorium on. And she created the greenhouse and the gardener's bothy. And you, when you came in to get your seat as a member of the audience, you walked through the whole thing. Mm. And it was just phenomenal. Just absolutely and it, phenomenal. And it was alive. I mean, it was the amount of plants and oh, flowers Keith, on the set. Keith did sterling work in terms of creating all, all the plants, but the, the props did sterling work as well, because every night they would take all the plants and that outside, down the back uh, corridor, uh, and leave them out overnight so they could get a good drenching and goodness knows what, as is always with our English weather. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it was a real tour de force on the part of everybody involved in that. Yeah, there's some, there's some very nice photos of that on the archive. Yes, it um, comes, comes out well, comes out well. Black and white and colour. Yes. So both bases covered. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any, any fondest happenings, any incidents over the years? Uh, well... Um, I mean, I've told, I have told this story many, many times, but if I go right back to the first show that I was involved in, Reluctant Heroes, it was a Brian Ricks farce, for those of us that can remember Brian Ricks and the, uh, the Whitehall farces. And the story 
was that the Brian Riggs part did something right for once instead of his usual bumbling way and got promoted uh, towards the very end of the show uh, to a Lance Corporal. And he felt very proud about this. And the story was that he would lit the cigarette of the sergeant who promoted him and then he would throw the match into the box and at the appropriate line wallop the box of ammunition went up and the set came down and brian ricks the hapless lance corporal as he was by that point was chased off stage by an irate sergeant that was the story the problem was that on the Thursday night of the run, Reg Fletcher, who had been the stage director up to that point for some reason, and I can't remember what, could not make it that night. So Jeff said, I'll do it, kid, don't worry, don't worry, I'll do it. He directed the show after all, so he should know the book and he should be able to do um, all that was necessary. But it also happened that the person who had been in charge of setting off the stage maroon, which is like a, a blooming big banger. Mm. Bigger, the biggest banger you've ever seen, uh, a maroon was like that. <clears throat> and we put it in a dustbin in what we call the kitchen uh, area, which is beyond the back of the, the stage. Cover it with uh, netting so that all the bits don't fly out. <coughs> Excuse me. And that was all set up. It ran to, a, the leads ran to uh, a switch, which Graham Fair, who was going to be the, uh, the switcher on, as it were, this night, was sat there. And he hadn't been doing this. He'd not been sort of uh, working on this show at all. So he was complete novice to it. And the, it all progressed. It all progressed. And it got toward the end, but before... Brian Rick's part lit Alan Warren's cigarette. And Jeff Bennett looked up from his book, placed his hand on Jeff, on Graham Fair's shoulder, and was about to say, It's coming, stand by, it's coming up in a minute. But Graham was so tense and nervous that he let fly the switch and the maroon went off about five pages too early. The two actors on stage just looked at each other and thought, what the heck is going on? And ran off. And we were all stood there wondering what was going to happen. So, but it was very funny, very funny. And I don't think um, Graham was ever, uh, he, he, he was never allowed to forget that. Was, no more bangers. Yeah. Absolute ban. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, there were uh, uh, other moments as well. I mean, the best prompt I ever saw taken was uh, an actor called John Burroughs, a very good friend and uh, wonderful teller of tales himself. Um, he was on stage in a show. Now, was it semi-detached? I can't quite remember. It was one of those at around that time. Anyway, John was playing a Birmingham bloke and he was on stage talking to another actor, Les Tucker, when one of them dried. We're not quite sure who it was, whether it was Les or whether it was John, but they dried. And then we heard from the wings a muffled voice of the prompter. <laughs> the two of them on stage looked at each other. You could see from their expressions that they didn't understand a word of that prompt. <laughs> there was a slight pause, and again, a voice from the wings came. <laughs> Les, by this time, was practically uh, distraught with this, all, all this going on. It was not how he liked to act. And John Burroughs looked at him, gripped his arm, and said, Hang about a bit in character, went halfway on, halfway off the stage, through the French windows, looked down at the prompt and said, I'm a bit sorry to hear, but I can't understand a word you're saying. Now, what was it? And she gave him the line and he came back on stage, 
looked at Les and said, right, where were we? <laughs> and carried on. I, I just thought it was hilarious. But I've got a feeling that um, Gene Warren, whose production I believe it was, was not very happy with John over that one. Yeah, there was. <laughs> it's 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 interesting, isn't it? it? The professionality of it. Some people would think that was wonderful, and the audience would probably quite enjoy it, and other people would be absolutely mortified. Well, I mean, I suppose in retrospect, it was a bit naughty, but I just found it very funny in those days. Yeah. But I was still youthful, I believe. In but there's been of... lots of things at the theatre that um, uh, have happened, uh, nothing to do with shows, particularly, that um, have been wonderful for the theatre and for the people going to it. Um, and obviously most of them were done by the people that go to to, to it. Um, I mean, things like uh, the Sing Along a Carol, which is still uh, very rife uh, at Christmas time, ending up, as always, with Bohemian Rhapsody, that firm carol favourite that we have. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I st also do remember years and years and years ago, um, a joke-telling competition. Uh, I'm going back to the 1970s, must be early 1970s, and it was really only for the men. I don't think we get away with it these days. But it was only for the men, you know, the men folk. And we took over the bar and uh, people just took it in turns to tell jokes. Some were a little, little more naughty than others. Others were just plain silly and, uh, and all the rest of it. And uh, there was one joke. I'm not going to tell it now. <laughs> <laughs> stop just, me, in the, bar, stop me in the bar and say I've never heard that one I'm just hovering but, over the button just in case <laughs> no I'm not going to tell it but it does have it's terrible terrible in it so if you know that expression you've probably already heard it and that was told by a, a, a darling old chap I think his name was Jack and he was part of a small group of blokes that used to come in every time the bar was open and um, enjoyed themselves, refreshed, refreshing themselves with, with the beers. And he told this joke, and I've never forgotten it, and it's still one of the mainstays of my um, uh, script, uh, as it were. But, yeah, that was, that was very, very funny. Very funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, what, what, what do you feel like the, um, the theatre means to you in terms of, I mean, you, you've lived quite locally to the theatre, all this time so and you know you're, you've been there an awful lot um yeah <laughs> um what does it mean to me it means an awful lot to me um in the early days it, it was for me a bit of an educator um i was probably not the finest of students at school um, I certainly didn't go to university, had no real desire to at all. So to see these plays talking about different philosophies, different ways of life, different situations, um, you know, you could glean an awful lot from that. You also obviously could glean uh, styles of acting and the way people approach acting and, and that sort of thing. So it was really quite an educator. And in general, just talking to people in the bar because of the, the topics of conversation ranged. It wasn't all always theatre. I mean, it would range uh, across quite a few things, um, you know. So, so yeah, I, I do like to think that it, it, it helped me uh, in that direction. Um, it also spurred me on to try professional acting. Um, uh, and to the, to the end, I, I went off to drama college for two years and, and then tried acting for several years after that. I did some things, which was nice. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I, I came to the conclusion that I am a home lover. I mean, by the time I, I finished, of course, I'd got not only a, a, a good wife, got a mortgage, got two kids, and somehow you have to sort of uh, 
fight your way through well not fight your way through that that sounds awful um <laughs> but you you have to 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 contend with um meeting those needs as well so but the important thing i think anyway is the fact that i did two years at drama college it did help to develop me again not necessarily as a great actor i'm not saying that for one for one minute but it gave me certain set of skills which when i look back over jobs that I subsequently went on to, I realised that that same set of skills helped me enormously in both uh, getting the, 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 the jobs that I did, but also helped me in those jobs. For instance, one of the, the, the main jobs that I did post theatre uh, was in a training situation where I trained people to train other people and assess them. So I both, I was a trainer and assessor of trainers and assessors, if that makes sense. It's a bit like doing it all with mirrors, you know, but um, but the, the acting skills helped in that regard. Mm -hmm. A, you don't mind standing up in front of people if you're making presentations or anything like that. Um, uh, B, you can, uh, you can perhaps, if you've got a sort of script, you can actually twist it and, and do things with it and, and learn to do that. So it all helped, I feel, for me to have had what I consider to be a very good life. Mm. And that comes, it has its roots very firmly in the criterion. Yeah. I think if I could, so. if I could, I would send every kid off to, um, to study acting. Not because I want them all to become actors, because 95% of them wouldn't do it, but because it gives them the right skill sets. Yeah, there's a lot of like team building stuff. Um, not, just, not just on stage, but, you know, working backstage as well. And especially, I think the criterion, the work ethic and the, the sort of the standard that is set and drilled into people when they join, um, you know, they see everybody taking it very, very seriously. Yes. Um, you know, having a good time while they do it. But, you know, you, you learn how to deal with people. You learn diplomacy. You learn um, all sorts of things that you can't be taught. It, it's well, sort you, of, certainly, you certainly don't get taught at school. Uh, no, I guess it's what, it's what people would call the university of life. And they're, they're obviously, yes. all yes. of those people are obviously awful. Um, anybody who describes <laughs> it. <laughs> but uh, the criterion genuinely is, I think. It is, yes. And also, it's it's led me on to a new lease of life to some extent. Not that I'm getting paid for this, but I've become a room guide for the National Trust. So <laughs> I go off once a week and um, and sort of delivering scripts. It's not that it's not that room, is it? Uh, it's not that what in this it's room. That, it's not that room. <laughs> oh yes, yes. These are all ancient first folio <laughs> books behind me. We'll come back. You can you can uh, subscribe to Pete's channel and. Uh, and... <laughs> And he'll, he'll reel off a whole tour of the house. Um, what would you like to see the theatre achieve next? What, what do you think the goal should be for the next 60 years? To develop the physical theatre. I think we will always have members uh, who push new styles of scripts, of, of theatres, of things to do and the ways to do it and all the rest of it. But I think we need to, to be able to utilise the physical space as best we can. And it's always been my thought, um, not only did I do the seats, <laughs> um, but I also, I don't know whether anybody's ever noticed, I also widened the proscenium arch by a foot either side at one point. <laughs> Can't quite remember. I think I think that was to help with sight lines when we played in the round as best we can. Yeah. Um, I think it was to help with sight lines. So I took a, a foot off uh, either side. Is this just but, before the roof started to become an issue? <laughs> by any chance? No, 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 no. Uh, I think that it was uh, actually, you're, you're right. It was before. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, I mean, I'd always had it in my mind, my vision, my personal vision 
and I have nothing whatsoever to substantiate it in terms of I've done drawings and I've done, you know, whatever, um, would be to A, get rid of the Pross Arch, the proscenium Arch, as a fixed item. Mm. She'd always have it ready, a, a false one, which is just sheer flattage to go back to go back up if you want to do a, an on stage production. Um, we all really desire that the spare land at the back is brought into being into the theatre. We we all desperately want to do that, and I know it's it's probably down to to funds, um, and the pandemic's not helped either in doing that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's making a more flexible and adaptable uh, working space. Um, to enable us to experience and to present uh, theatre of, of, of many different styles and, uh, and ways. That would be my sort of main idea uh, at any rate. Well, maybe if you can, if you can raise enough money from these people who are going to subscribe to your room tours, then... Well, I'm, I'm just writing, rewriting me will here, so be kind to me and I might just leave a little. Do you still have the extra two feet of proscenium arch? Uh... Are you still in possession of that, or because? Well, we um, do, I, do you think we can sell them off, or do you want to put them back? <laughs> I just want to know where where they are. You know, we just need <laughs> to keep keep tabs on them. You never know. No, I think um, I think uh, they went up in flames on one of George Hugill's uh, fires at the back of the uh, <laughs> the theatre. And, and we have to say again, in those days, you could just do <laughs> that. Was <laughs> just do what you want. That was absolutely yes, that, fine. That was another. That was another funny anecdote. It was um, for, for those of you that remember George Hugill, he was a dear man, um, and he, he didn't do a lot of acting, mainly because he had a very strong Geordie accent, like you know. Um, but he would work willingly in the corner, and I do remember one dress rehearsal of a show. I can't remember which show it was. And uh, he decided he would start, he hadn't got a lot to do in the corner. So he decided he'd start a fire out the back and just burn the rubbish that accumulated during the rehearsals and build. So he was busy going around the stage. <laughs> he appeared across the back of the, the, the set, collecting bits of paper and wood and all the rest of it to take out to, the, to burn at the back. Meanwhile, the actors were getting this smoke wafting in because he got the doors open. Ah, health and safety. Yes, it's very important. Where everybody. are you when we need you? <laughs> well, it's been lovely to talk to you. Um, Thank you. It's always nice to talk to you, but uh, it's been especially nice to get some of these memories recorded uh, and hopefully see you soon. Um, yes, indeed. In, yeah. in, the, in the building itself. Well, that will be really great. And uh, I'll stand you a pint. Oh. Well, well, or, or maybe a half. I don't know. I've, I've, got, that on, I've got that on tape. I'll the see point. where the pensions come in that week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Pete. Okay, cheers. <laughs>